Welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us this evening on this Zoom call with the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. My name is Alyssa Osborne and I'm a Director of Development with the College of Arts and Sciences and I will be serving as the host and moderator for this evening. I have met many of you and welcome the opportunity to meet more of you in the future when uh, we are able to travel again. Um, but I'm very much looking forward to this evening's um, opportunity to get some updates from the faculty and students in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. You will see that there is both a chat button and a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Tonight's presentation is meant to be interactive and we would like to really encourage everybody to ask questions and share feedback with the panelists using the Q&A button. We would also like to welcome any personal updates you might have and those can be shared, shared in the chat function of Zoom. Um, we will be monitoring the Q&A uh, tab so please feel free um, and we encourage you to ask questions as they come up and we will get to as many of them as possible. If we're unable to get to um, your question within the uh, time allotted for the panelists, we will come back to it at the end where we've allotted a few more minutes for q and I'd like to introduce now um, Chair of the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, uh, Dr. David Polly. He has been doing research um, or has been with the department since 2006, and his research um, is largely around mammalian paleontology, quantitative evolution, and biotic responses to changing Earth systems. David, I will let you take it away. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, we appreciate it and um, want to share some of the things that have been happening in the department. I have been chair for just a little over 12 months. Um, and a lot has happened in those 12 months. Um, I'll share some of it with you um, right now. We'll start with what has been having in everyone's life, which is the pandemic, um, which has um, brought about big changes at IU as it has everywhere. Um, and just want to briefly mention um, some of the, the links that IU has gone to keep faculty and students safe, including a huge mitigation testing where uh, many of us are, ran actually all of us are randomly called um, on an almost weekly basis to um, be tested. Um, this is one of the testing centers. The IU um, Genomics Center has been sort of um, taken over for COVID testing. Um, we have had some in-person classes. Um, last spring, we were completely online when the pandemic started, but in the fall and this spring, um, we have some online classes, some hybrid classes and some in-person classes. And this is um, just a picture of one of our classrooms set up for um, distanced hybrid um, seating. There's been a lot of turnover in the last several years. And some of you I know have been in touch with us um, quite recently, but some of them, some of you um, not so recently, um, but it's been a huge period of turnover in our faculty. Um, we've had a lot of faculty who have retired in the last um, four years, um, even. Um, Gary Pavlis um, from geophysics retired, um, Ed Ripley, um, geochemistry, um, David Bish in clay mineralogy, um, Lisa Pratt, also in geochemistry. Jim Brophy, who was the chair um, immediately before me, um, has retired and moved to Maine. Um, and most recently, last December, um, Bruce Douglas retired. Uh, and you know, these are faculty who've been with the department for many, many years and have really left vacuum behind them. Um, however, um, we also have enjoyed uh, being able to hire several new faculty um, some of whom you will meet tonight. Um, ben Kravitz at the left is an atmospheric scientist um, who um, joined the department as part of the IU Grand Challenges um, hiring program, um, as did Travis O'Brien, another atmospheric scientist, and you'll meet Travis um, later this evening. Uh, of the people on the screen here, Brian Unitas has been with us um, the longest. He's been here about five years, I believe. Um, Brian is a geomorphologist who came from University of Idaho um, and has just gone through um, promotion. Um, at the top, Jess Miller Camp is a research scientist who is working as our new paleontology collection manager. 
Um, at the bottom right, Shelby Rader, who is a research scientist and does metal isotope geochemistry. Um, you'll also meet Shelby later tonight. Um, and Andrea Stevens Goddard, um, who does basin analysis and thermochronology, and um, who you'll meet tonight, and who is um, our inaugural Lee J. Sutner um, chair. Um, we've also had several deaths in the last few years of uh, professors emeritus, um, some of whom um, were still very active in the department. Um, Don Hatton passed away in 2016, as did Earl Kaufman. John Hayes, who had not been in the department for a while, but um, some of you may have known, depending on when you were at IU, passed away in 2017, um, as did John Drosty. Um, Larry Onesti passed away in 2018, um, and Bob Dodd um, passed away just in 2019, having um, been, been very active as an emeritus professor until he moved to uh, New Mexico to be closer to his children not long before he passed away. Um, another major thing that has happened um, this past year is that our building has been renovated. And one thing I can say, if you are going to have a pandemic and you're going to have a building renovation, you might as well do them at the same time um, because they are both disruptive. Um, and in some ways, um, the fact that they were going on together made each one of them um, slightly um, more convenient than it might have been otherwise. And probably most of you have visited the Geological Sciences Building, um, which has many quirks. Um, and I want to show you a few pictures of what it looked like during the renovation. Um, it really was renovated top to bottom, inside out. This is the second floor hallway, um, which you may barely recognize because on the left, um, all of that open space were chases that ran the top to the bottom of the building, um, which were among other things filled with asbestos, uh, which has now been cleaned out. Um, but many of the ducts and pipes and everything else have been um, rechanneled. Um, anyone who has been in the Geological Sciences Building and spent much time there will remember the mystery elevator. Um, there being two elevator doors, only one of which opened. Um, that one elevator um, was never an elevator. Um, it was an empty shaft and that has been now, now been um, closed off nicely, refinished and used as a, another major chaseway through the building. Um, and there's been a lot of reorganization of rooms um, and reconfiguration of offices and et cetera. This being formerly room 209, a graduate student office in its last days, um, which has now been reconfigured. And a few of you may actually recognize this, an area that's been opened up. Um, and what makes it recognizable are the pink walls, um, which were th the walls of the office of Robert Winch, um, who allegedly um, was on sabbatical or in the field when the building was painted at some point. And um, as I remember the story, um, Basu called him and asked Bob, what color would you like your office? And Bob said, I don't care, it could be pink. Um, and it was pink for many, many years, um, but no longer. I um, want to show you what it looks like. It's a complete transformation. Um, this is a picture of the lobby as of just a couple of days ago. Um, we're just moving in. Um, in technical sense, the renovation is not quite finished. There are still some things going on, um, but most of, actually all of us are now moved in and um, you can kind of get a sense of what it looks like. The lobby just looks absolutely beautiful. Um, they made the um, whole building ADA accessible, which meant we needed to have a ramp. Um, and they built this ramp around the margins of the lobby, which will um, really highlight our display cases there and, and make it much more visually interesting. Here's um, another view of the lobby. A lot of the ground floor has been opened up into commons areas, which makes it brighter because you have um, light coming in from the, the north side, or sorry, the south side. Um, yes, the south side. Um, and several areas have been opened up into to student commons areas. And you see a couple of shots of them here. Um, there are break areas on each floor. Um, this is the, the restroom area on the fourth floor. And again, those of you who have um, spent any time in the building will know that the building didn't really have women's restrooms when it was built, um, only a couple of them, but now it does. 
um, restrooms completely reconfigured so we actually have proper women's restrooms um, wellness rooms for um, changing diapers or what have you um, and all gender restrooms and this picture um, even though it is not terribly exciting, is one of the most exciting things that happened, in my opinion. This is the Northwest stairwell that, again, if you spent time in the building, you will recognize, have known as a complete, still concrete, unpainted cinder block um, stairwell, which has now been painted. And I'm going to turn it over to the panelists, but before I go, I want to thank all of you. Um, our alumni have been really important in supporting our department and developing the funds that we use. Um, and the pandemic has made it all the more obvious how much these funds uh, mean to the department. We've been able to keep going um, more or less as normal despite um, temporary budget cuts. Um, and I especially want to highlight the Lee J. Sutner Professorship in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, which is our newest endowed chair. And you'll meet Andrea Stevens Goddard in just a moment, who's the, the first faculty member to hold that. The Robert Sanger Scholarship established this year. And also the Mary Iverson Graduate um, Fellowship, which has been especially important this year um, in the pandemic and providing extra support to students um, and for which we are still um, welcoming donations. So I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Alyssa, who will introduce our first panel. Hello again, and thank you so much, David. Um, that was a wonderful synopsis of everything that has been happening, and it has certainly been a lot. I'd like to introduce Andrea Stevens Goddard, Michael Hamburger, and Dylan Steele. Um, as we mentioned in the chat section of the um, Zoom call, there was several YouTube videos that were put together um, by each of these individuals talking about um, some of their research. And I'd highly encourage you to um, go on it and watch all of them um, when you get a chance. The link for those is in the invite. Um, but if you weren't able to do that, we wanted to make sure that you would um, still be able to sort of understand what was going on and be able to ask some questions. So I'm going to ask each of them to give just a brief, brief synopsis on their videos um, and then invite anybody to ask questions. Um, and we'll go from there. Thank you so much, Andrea. Can you start us off? Sure. Thanks so much, Alyssa. So um, I am, as David has mentioned, the brand new addition to the department, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, my expertise is in basin analysis, and on top of that, I have a, a specialization in low temperature thermochronology. So this is great because, um, you know, as we study basins, we're, we're still kind of rooted in those fundamental things that probably you learned in your said strat class or in your, you know, graduate level basin analysis class. We go out and we make these observations and understand how the basins formed and where the material was coming from. Um, but thermochronology is a tool that allows us to understand the timing and rates of processes. That includes the timing and rates of, of erosional processes that are contributing to the basin and the timing and rates of basin formation, how you're creating that space to hold all of the sediment. And so it's really exciting that I'm able to bring this lab here to IU. And what I'm actually going to be setting up is called a, a fission track lab. And so fission track is a, is a tool is a, uh, for low temperature thermochronology um, where we uh, measure the last time that a mineral was at a, a relatively low temperature for you know, fission track for the mineral appetite, it's about 120 degrees C. So we can think about that as three to four kilometers in the air. And as those rocks that have those minerals in them pass through the closure temperature, um, we're locking in the time of, of cooling. So you can think about all of the geologic processes that that time, that date is actually giving us. And I'm setting up that lab now in the brand new renovated space, which is really exciting. And um, as Lee, or as uh, David mentioned, I'm the, also the first Lee J. Sutner chair, and that is a huge honor for me. Um, I actually, um, of the Lee lineage, several generations removed, but was always someone that I um, respected and looked up to and read the paper. So I've worked with, you know, IU alumni throughout my career, um, uh, Ken Ridgeway at Purdue, uh, Pete DeSells 
at IU. I worked with Julie Fosdick, who's a Steve Graham alum uh, in my postdoc. So basically every step of the way, I was getting a little bit of that input and I'm delighted to return. So I'll turn it over. I guess maybe Michael is next. I'm happy to take the baton from here. And I'm so pleased to see so many friends and uh, familiar names on the, on the uh, alumni list. Uh, Andrea, we're so glad to have you as part of our department. She is the bright, fresh face in the department and I'm the grizzled old guy now. Um, but uh, the, the video that we put together is kind of a tag team, uh, in a way, kind of three generations in the geophysics world. Um, it's a project that involved myself and a former graduate student, Anna Nowicki Jesse, who's now on the faculty at IUPUI, and Dylan Seal, who you'll hear from in a moment. Um, for me, a lifelong seismologist, it was kind of a, a foray into uh, a little bit out of my comfort zone into the intersection of seismology and geomorphology, understanding a peculiar and really dangerous secondary effect of earthquakes, and that's earthquake triggered landslides. And um, one of the interesting things actually about both parts of this project is um, that I was kind of led into them by, um, by serendipity and by student activity. So Anna did a, an internship at the USGS during her first year as a graduate student, I don't know, about eight, uh, nine years ago, uh, that led us into this uh, study of earthquake-induced landslides, ended up building a global model to predict where and when uh, earthquake triggered landslides uh, would be likely to occur in the aftermath of a major earthquake. It's developed into a, um, uh, a kind of well-tested tool that's now part of the USGS's uh, real-time or near real-time earthquake reporting system. You can check out on the earthquakes.usgs.gov website. And then uh, Dylan has jumped into a new element. Uh, I'll let Dylan tell a little bit the story about how he got involved, but we've taken this kind of global model and applied it to a really interesting place in uh, Costa Rica, which has a, uh, a very rich history of landslides and earthquakes and all of the uh, interconnections between those phenomena. Um, and just a kind of personal note, one of my great pleasures about being a faculty member at Indiana University is the amazing group of students who I've had the chance to work with over the years. And um, Dylan is our first inaugural Rudman Pavlis undergraduate fellow in uh, geophysics, and he's doing his uh, undergraduate thesis on this um, earthquake-induced landslide project. So Dylan, take it away. Hey, everybody. I'm Dylan. I'm a fourth year undergrad, um, majoring in earth science. Um, and so, yeah, as Michael said, about 12 months ago, I was awarded the Rudman Pavlis Fellowship in Geophysics Research, which has been a great, great opportunity. Um, and as you may have saw in the video, most recently, we've been uh, able to study earthquake induced landslides in Costa Rica through a really great collaboration that uh, kind of emerged out of nowhere from an email correspondence. Um, and so using that, we've been able to look at um, kind of the seismic and earthquake-induced landslide hazard throughout Costa Rica, which is really an interesting place to look at uh, hazard because Costa Rica has an active subduction zone, a series of um, active volcanoes, backward thrusting. So it's really a, a valuable place to apply our tools. And so, my work has been using hypothetical scenario earthquakes. Um, so uh, kind of trying to predict where future earthquakes might happen based on historical seismicity. And so using that along with honest global earthquake-induced landslide model allows us to kind of look at the different controls on earthquake-induced landsliding, whether that be slope, ground wetness, um, et cetera. And then also we get a flavor of the impact um, from these events. So really a valuable tool and Costa Rica is probably the best place to look at it. So yeah, it's been a really great opportunity and that's been thanks to the Redmond Pavlis Fellowship. So yeah. All right. So I 
will kick things off with a couple of questions, um, but I would encourage all of our attendees to ask questions. I am not a geologist or a scientist in any way, so my questions will be very basic compared to anybody else's that is asked. I was just going to start off um, with Dylan and ask him to just share a little bit more about um, your undergraduate experience at IU and maybe how the pandemic has affected um, your research, or hopefully it hasn't, um, but just kind of share a little bit more about your time at IU. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I actually came into IU as a pre-med, surprisingly, but I took a physical geology course in the department my first semester here, which I was hooked instantly and haven't really looked back since. Who taught that um, course, Dylan? Uh, Laura Wazalinki. Oh, great. Uh -huh. She's uh, not here anymore, but great professor. And so yeah, over the past four years, I've taken many, many courses in the department. Um, and I've always found the faculty to be really supportive. I haven't found any faculty that I don't get along with, which is great. And it's kind of a testament to the department as a whole. Um, so then fast forwarding to my junior year, I uh, was awarded the Rudman Pavlis Fellowship, which allowed me to work with Michael, which um, the work's really computational. So it hasn't really been affected too much by the pandemic. Um, but it is kind of interesting. I've only met with Michael in person once, I think, and we've been meeting weekly for the past year. Um, and I guess the pandemic also makes uh, coursework a bit harder because of Zoom. But overall, I think our research has really been unhindered by it. And I've had nothing but good experiences within the department. And uh, there's no better place to do your undergrad than IU. Dylan, maybe it is worth mentioning. Uh, he is a bit modest about it, but he was awarded a super competitive uh, REU fellowship to work in Hawaii last summer. Uh, so instead of studying active volcanoes in Hawaii, uh, he was in Indiana studying uh, earthquakes and landslides at a distance. So that certainly was one, one effect. And probably this Costa Rica project will and at some point or another work into a field-based project and hopefully Dylan, you'll get a chance to be part of that in, in one way or another. Fingers crossed. And Dylan, I'm biased, but I would say IU is a fantastic place for an undergrad experience. I have a question here from um, Kevin and he wants to know, um, this is for Andrea, whether you have any Illinois Basin or Michigan Basin work planned. Well, I'm actually really glad that you asked that quite specific question. Um, I do, and I have. Actually, I came here to IU with, um, I was awarded a grant a couple of years ago um, to start some work in the Michigan Basin, understanding how cratonic basins form. And what we're using is that we're, we're trying to understand the, the thermal history of the basin using the, that, those thermal records as a proxy for basin formation mechanisms. So if there was just the basin was filling in or if there was something down from below that was maybe pulling that basin down. So that work is ongoing and I'm excited to kind of transition to some more mid-continent work here at IU. I've already visited the core lab, which is, you know, in renovations been moving around um, and sampled actually some basement samples. Um, and I'm actually uh, in you know, preliminary stages of talking with some IU alums um, from the geophysics group who are now at Purdue. So Xiao Tao Yang and I have been talking about this idea, kind of kicking around, trying to understand the timing that arch is formed, where I would be looking at timing of, you know, arch formation and segmenting these basins. And he would be looking at the, you know, geophysical observations they can make about the properties of those things. So I definitely am excited to, to have some roots here in Indiana, uh, mid-continent uh, geology. Thank you, Andrea. So we have a question here. I believe, Michael, this is maybe to you. Um, do hurricanes in Costa Rica alter the earthquake landslide predictive model you have developed? Oh boy, that's a hard one. And a really interesting thing that I've learned as a newcomer to the landslide world is that there are really two very different families of landslides, ones that are triggered by rainfall uh, and ones that are triggered by earthquakes. 
Uh, and of course, there are other types of landslides. Those are the dominant classes, and they're often different people who study them and we're using somewhat different techniques. But more like with everything in earth sciences, we're discovering more and more connections between them. So for example, the pre-existing conditions of soil wetness, for example, um, may lead to increased uh, or in some cases decreased uh, hazard to earthquake triggered landslides. And secondly, once an earthquake um, kind of loosens the uh, earth materials in a variety of ways, it turns out that for several years afterwards, rainfall triggered landslides are more likely and that difference gradually dies down or returns to its normal state. Um, and maybe it's worth um, mentioning one other interesting connection. This semester, uh, we're doing a very nice uh, interdisciplinary tectonic seminar. Andrea is taking part and Dylan uh, and Brian Unites, who you heard about a moment ago, who is very interested in landslide processes as geomorphic agents. So we're kind of looking at these tectonic and geomorphic processes at a variety of timescales from the timescale of an earthquake to a few minutes to uh, the geomorphic timescale of uh, centuries to millennia to the deep time that uh, Andrea introduced in her video. Thank you so much, Michael. And I just want to sort of give a, a heads up and just reiterate, I'm seeing a few questions pop up, which is fantastic. Please keep sending them. Um, Joel and Dave, I see your questions. Um, just to make sure that we give all panelists sort of an equal opportunity to um, talk about their work. I'm going to hold off on um, the questions that we have up, go move to the next set of panelists. And then at the very end, we'll come back and sort of rapid fire um, a bunch of these. Just we make sure that we um, get to talk to everybody that's here. So I see questions and we will make sure we get to them. So our next group of panelists, and thank you, Michael, Andrea, and Dylan, fantastic. We will see you just a little bit later. Our next group of panelists are atmospheric scientists, and they include Paul Statton, Travis O'Brien, and Lon Luan. Juan, sorry, Lon, I know I totally messed that up. Um, I would like to ask each of you also to give just a brief synopsis of the video that you have put online. Um, and then we will start taking questions from the audience again. And please keep them coming if we don't get to them in this session or in this um, small amount of time, we'll do it at the very end. Go ahead, Paul, I'll give you the mic. Thanks, Lisa, And thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, yeah, actually it's, it's uh, it's fun to think back on, um, you know, like how I got here. You know, my curiosity about the atmosphere and the Earth uh, with this new, uh, the new Mars mission that just landed, Perseverance. Um, I actually got started my research uh, by doing an internship as an undergrad at uh, JPL, working on a, a spectrometer instrument that did not go up ten years ago on the Mars Science Laboratory aboard uh, Curiosity. And that got me curious at a PhD University of Utah in the geological wonderland that is Utah uh, before going back to JPL for a postdoc using satellite data. And then I came here to IU. And um, I, I just right from the start, I loved IU, just um, the welcome I received uh, from people like Lisa Pratt and Greg Oliphant, Michael Hamburger and Gary Pavlis. Um, I fell in love with the town. It's a fantastic place for me and my family. I love the culture of support at IU that like that I feel as a faculty member, as a young faculty member, and as I feel for the students. Um, the computational resources here are fantastic. I love just being able to do my job and not stress out constantly about um, clearing data off of hard drive somewhere. Um, I hope to take advantage of the field station, teach over there. I think that's an amazing resource we've got. And, uh, you know, we've got pretty great geology here. I, I thought Utah was fantastic, but you actually have to go way down in, in the Grand Canyon before you get to anything as old as you have out here in Indiana. And I am not a geologist, so um, you could probably tell me just how far you have to go down. Um, and then great weather here too. You have really beautiful frontal systems here um, that don't really, uh, don't, most of them form on the east side of the Rockies. So we didn't get that out west so much. Um, and then here I, I study large scale atmospheric circulation. That's, that's the key is, is the large scale. So um, I study how the jet stream shifts as like as a climate warms or during like an El Nino versus a La Nina year 
or how the tropical Hadley circulation widens. Uh, it, it's actually interesting. It's been observed to widen. And for a while, we were thinking, wow, this is actually widening a couple degrees per decade, which was really fast. And models agreed that it should widen with a warmer atmosphere, but not that fast. And so I actually led a working, uh, I co-led a working group on the subject. Um, also, uh, from my JPL work with satellites, I, I like to study using not just climate models, but also satellite data to understand uh, how clouds are changing, because the large scale circulation is what gives birth to cloud formations. It's the sets the environment for these clouds. And you can learn a lot about these changes using satellite data. And uh, recently I've started uh, using this satellite data um, to look above the troposphere, the bottom layer of the atmosphere, up into the stratosphere, because uh, changes in the circulation in the stratosphere determine how much water vapor is up in the stratosphere and how uh, radiation, uh, how much radiation, you know, makes it down through the stratosphere or makes it up to the stratosphere from the surface. So it's, it's actually pretty important for climate down here. So that's what I do. I, I, I study the large scale circulation. So if you saw Ben Kravitz's video, Ben is an expert modeler. And I love working with people like Ben because they make great data for me to play with and try to understand. And uh, then I, I love seeing uh, like Travis O'Brien and his work um, that takes place uh, on the on the scales where like I can see, I, I look at and I can see how the large scale uh, circulation should affect things. And then Travis looks at it and determines how it really does. And so Travis is, uh, I think Travis is next. Is that right, Alyssa? Yes, Travis is next. All right. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, hello. I'm really delighted to be here uh, interacting with you all. I really will look forward to meeting you all in person at some point at a future alumni event. And I got to say, I am super happy to be here at IU. I've been here just a little over 12 months. My first day at IU was the first day that David Pauly took over as department chair. Um, I come here from California, and when I was interviewing out here, I got a bit of skepticism that I would actually make the move from California, but I got to say, it really said something about this department, that it was so clear from interacting with people that this was a once-in-a-career opportunity to not only come to a department where the people are just fantastic. It's it's one of the healthiest, best vibing departments I've seen. It's also got a new atmospheric science program. We've just got a new atmospheric science bachelor of science degree, uh, a bunch of early career faculty trying to get this program off the ground in an earth science department where students can learn about weather and climate change in the context of earth's history, which I think is just awesome. So my research is on what causes the weather that we experience to vary from year to year. So sometimes we get these years where, you know, there's just a lot of storms in the year. Other years we get droughts. Why does that happen? And how will climate change affect that? So what I talk about in a little, a little bit in the video uh, that's in the YouTube playlist is one of my research interests is on coastal fog. Growing up in California, going to school at UC Santa Cruz, uh, coastal fog was a big part of life there. Now, this is part of a big deck of clouds. Paul was talking about clouds being really important for the climate. These clouds, uh, stratocumulus clouds is what they're called, reflect a lot of sunlight back to space. If we lose those clouds, the Earth will get warmer. Um, and so a big question is, how will these clouds change as global warming uh, goes on further? Um, will we lose these clouds or will we gain more? Um, in the region where these clouds intersect the shore, that's where we get fog. And this fog is really important for ecology along the West Coast. It's also really important for a lot of other things, transportation, for example. Um, San Francisco Airport has uh, two runways and they're configured unfortunately such that if there's fog in San Francisco, which there's often fog in San Francisco, they have to go down to one runway, which uh, slows down air traffic everywhere. So how will this change in the future? I use climate models and observational data to uh, try and under to test hypotheses about how fog and clouds and other uh, types of weather will change and what drives their changes from year to year. So that's all I got to say. And I think, uh, Mon, you're next. All right. Thank you, um, Travis. And hello, everyone. I'm Lan. And I'm a fourth year PhD student studying in IU. And I come from northeast part of China. Uh, I really like Bloomington because the climate here is very similar to my hometown. So it makes me feel good. And um, um, and I'm 
working with Dr. Paul Staten, and recently we are working with two scientists from Boulder. Although I didn't get a chance to visit them last summer, but we um, have a chance to chat online and discuss about research. And recently we are working on the tropical tropopause layer structure and how water vapor change in that region. Like Paul mentioned, um, in the stratosphere, sphere, the um, water vapor is pretty important because it can influence the uh, radiation budget around the whole globe. And in the tropical region, it is where the water vapor um, mainly comes from for the stratosphere. And the water vapor there can only uh, can not only influence the uh, radiation budget, it can also influence the climate around the whole globe. So that's why we are interesting, interested in looking at that. And um, there are many factors can influence the uh, tropical travel pods uh, structure and the water vapor. And the main, uh, one main feature is the cosi biannual oscillation. It's the changing of prevailing wind um, from westerly to easterly or uh, from easterly to westerly. And there are two anomalous QBO happened uh, since its discovery. And the recent one is uh, 2020 last year. And we are pretty uh, interested in looking at that. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, Paul, Lon, and Travis for the brief um, information about your videos and your work. Uh, please, uh, attendees, uh, ask any questions that you might have in the chat. I'll get things kicked off again. Lon, I know that you are an international student, so this pandemic has particularly affected you. Um, and you were on campus the entire time. So just kind of wanted to ask what changed with the pandemic and when things sort of on the university um, closed down, how were you affected and how are things currently? Yeah, thank you, Alesha, uh, for the question. Uh, so uh, last year, when the pandemic first uh, happened, um, IU uh, announced that it is going to close the campus and also the campus housing. Because I live on campus, I feel quite nervous during that time because all of a sudden I feel I'm homeless. Um, but I'm really glad uh, later on IU um, uh, didn't close, only close very small portion of the campus housing and leave most of the campus housing open. And also, um, so I uh, get a chance to stay at my um, same apartment. Uh, also, like David mentioned, IU test us regularly every week. So um, starting this semester, we are tested twice a week for the COVID. So it's pretty safe um, to uh, live in IU. And also, I feel it keeps um, the whole community safe as well. Thank you, Lon. Absolutely. If I could add to that, um, you know, I, I sent, uh, I have my kids, my kids were uh, doing school at home. Uh, I re we recently sent a, a few of them back into in person schooling. And as we've watched the, um, you know, schools here in Bloomington and elsewhere, um, I use efforts, like Lon said, really have helped uh, keep the entire community safe. And I'm able to send my kids to school in part because of that. I would agree. I think we can all say that we have been tested uh, more than probably the general population for sure. So we have a question from uh, Tom Mead, and he is wanting to know um, about any work being done by you guys regarding interactions with ocean currents. I can I can jump right in on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm really glad you asked about that. Um, actually, fog is uh, an area of research where the oceans make a really big difference. Um, one of the, the first hypotheses for how climate change might affect fog is that with a warming climate, you'll get uh, warmer land. Uh, the ocean won't warm quite as much. That'll drive stronger winds along the shore, and those stronger winds will drive stronger currents. So more colder wa water from the north, more uh, cold water from the deep. We're, we still don't actually know whether that hypothesis will pan out. Um, observationally, we're seeing some evidence that uh, ocean currents are cooling, um, but it turns out that 
uh, it may be more complicated than just ocean, uh, the winds driving uh, more upwelling. So it's, it's not clear from an ocean uh, current point of view whether that's the case. Um, part of the reason we don't know the answer to this question is that uh, in order to understand fog and climate change, really what you need is to consider it as a system. So the atmosphere interacting with the ocean and the nearby land surface. And up until just like the last year or two, there haven't really been models in place that can simulate all of the uh, phenomena that you would need to simulate in order to get these interactions. So you need a uh, global, you need an ocean model with resolutions of like a couple kilometers. So dividing the ocean up into boxes or that are about a kilometer or so on the side, the atmosphere maybe five to 10 kilometers. Um, only just now in the last few years have we started to get models like that. And I'm really looking forward to actually doing research using these to, to see how both the ocean and the atmosphere will change as climate warms. And on the large scale, uh, typically the, the leading order impact the atmosphere has on the ocean is by uh, winds over the ocean floor, which can modify ocean circulation. A big topic uh, right now in my field, not one that I'm working on, is uh, changes in um, currents in the Southern Ocean because of the jet stream over there. Meanwhile, the ocean has a dominating effect on the atmosphere, like Travis mentioned, because of temperature, heat exchange between the ocean and atmosphere. And uh, that was one of the, the big things of my working group is understanding what changes in the circulation are a result of global warming versus what uh, changes in the circulation are just the result of uh, year to year or decade to decade changes in sea surface temperatures. There was you know, the El Nino and now there's uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which we're all learning about. It used to be that we thought you could just average over seven years and you didn't have to worry about El Nino. It's not true. It's much longer and much more important than that. So. The ocean is the elephant in the room for all of our research, I think, whether or not we are studying changes in ocean circulation. I think it's about time to invite our um, environmental scientists into the room here. And I would like to introduce Chen Zhu, Arndt Schimmelman, and Shelby Rader. Um, I will start with Chen. Please uh, feel free to give us a, a few minutes of uh, information about your research and the video that you uh, posted to YouTube. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Chen Zhu. I study water and water interactions with the minerals. I uh, have been with the department for 17 years. Time goes fast. Uh, I can tell you a few happenings in Bloomington. In the last two years, my student and I developed uh, two projects that potentially benefit people in Indiana. I assembled a very large team at IU and I developed a hydrological model for the Wabash Basin. Uh, the model projects water availability to the end of the century. Uh, so you can visit uh, futurewater.indiana.edu. It's a futurewater.indiana.edu to learn more about it. Um, our alarm, Randy Barris, was very helpful. Uh, with his help, uh, we are now adding groundwater aquifers into the model. I have also worked with the IU Center for Rural Engagement uh, to develop a program for arsenic contamination in groundwater. It's probably very hard to believe that uh, we are the world's only superpower and one of the wealthiest nation, but our citizens are still drinking water that exceeding arsenic standard, and this is happening right now as we speak. So uh, both projects made it possible because uh, David and Polly, our chair, um, took leadership role in this grand challenge project. And David uh, uh, really brought back research money and uh, raised the visibility. So uh, thank you, David, for these two projects. Um, at the national and international scale, uh, the Groundwater Foundation selected me as the Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecture for 2021 and 2022. The lecture series honored um, Henry Darcy, the French engineer who discovered the Darcy's law for fluid flow in 1856. Previous Darcy lectures gave about 100 talks around the world. And uh, I'm very grateful to David and uh, the Dean Rick Van Kooten for relieving my teaching duties. So in the next year and a half, if um, we can <laughs> uh, temper <laughs> the COVID, I'll be traveling around and uh, um, uh, if you like me to give a Darcy lecture to your organization, please contact the Groundwater Foundation. For virtual lectures, it costs nothing uh, to the host. So thank you very much for your support and for participating today. I'm Arshman, I'm a geochemist. 
And before I ex explain my research, I want to thank Ruth Droppo for providing this wonderful uh, video of my work in Vietnam. Why, why do I work in Vietnam? My, my wife is Vietnamese and she showed me her country about six years ago and we traveled there. And I realized that the landscape was fantastic for uh, assessing the, the sink of methane uh, when microbes uh, near the surface of the earth can uh, take it up and use it as for, for energy. So in the moist and warm climate, climate in Vietnam, you have lots of caves. And in fact, we could document that methanotrophs, um, bacteria that use up methane, can take up much of this um, greenhouse gas. And it helps a great deal uh, to limit global warming if you can mitigate some of this uh, impact. So why Vietnam? OK, uh, I didn't have any plan to work there, really. Uh, but when we came back to Hanoi, my wife just called the university and asked for some geochemist who worked there. And we got a connection. And he managed to get, get us into contact with, with some young faculty, very young faculty. And with those, we really hit it off. So we went there every year. And uh, it's a fantastic experience. And I want to encourage all of you, not only those who work in academia, if you have a chance to work with young faculty in developing nations, it is extremely rewarding. It doesn't take much of your time, doesn't take much money, but they are so eager to learn. They are just like sponges. They, they take what you tell them and then they run with it. So one of our colleagues over there, he got a Fulbright now and he's coming to my lab in a couple of months to work here for five months. We have publications out. It is so much fun. In my 28 years at IU, I never had uh, colleagues and projects that are so rewarding and so much fun. So all of you, please, if you have a chance to meet young people abroad with scientific interests that may somehow met you, try to pass on your knowledge and encourage them to be productive. What a wonderful uh, happenstance, aren't I? appreciate you sharing that. Uh, Shelby, I think we will give you a couple minutes to uh, tell us about your video, please. Sure. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, and thanks to all of you all. Um, I am relatively new to the department. I started in fall of 2019. And just like everyone else has mentioned, the reception from the department and from Bloomington has just been fantastic. It's such a nice program and such a nice place to be. Um, so I'm a trace metal geochemist. And part of my responsibilities here to help with the uh, trace metal isotopes lab that's part of the department, which is an incredible facility and, and post COVID, if any of you all are ever in Bloomington, you're always welcome to come by and, and see it and see, see it in action. Um, and so as a trace metal geochemist, I look at trace metals. So these are going to be elements that are in very low concentrations in geologic and biologic material. And so through that process, my goal is to try to understand how metals are redistributed in our environment um, to try to better inform geologic processes, environmental remediation processes, um, and some biologic processes. And so when I say trace metals, these are typically things that are um, at the concentration level of parts per million. Um, and so that's kind of abstract. And so essentially, if we were to put that in, in more relatable terms, um, it would be like taking the entire population of Indiana and being tasked with identifying six or seven individual people. Um, so it's actually very, very challenging, but the fact that we're able to accomplish that, to measure things in such small concentrations is really incredible to me. And so we can do it with um, rock materials, with plant materials, with human materials like blood and urine. Um, and so it's, it's very versatile and has lots of applications. Um, so I look at those changing concentrations as well as isotopic ratios um, to try to understand how metals are moving um, through subduction zone environments. So whether things are getting recirculated back to our crust or whether they're contaminating the deeper mantle. Um, also look at them in relation to ore deposits, to economic ore deposits, um, to try to better understand how they form and how we can better explore for them, um, but also how we can better plan for remediation techniques um, after the life of the mine is complete. And so there are a lot of applications for that. Um, and so we, we really try to focus on those across the geologic and biologic realms. 
Shelby, while you're on here, we actually have a question um, for you from Philip wanting to know whether um, when you're working in the clean room, whether you have to be concerned with or avoid uh, cosmetics and hair products. Yes, that's a great question. So we do have to be incredibly careful. Um, so we look at a variety of different elements in there, um, some of which are fairly common naturally. So lead is one of those. Um, so even having dust or soil material on the bottom of your shoes can affect your, your measurements and your samples. Um, so uh, in the video that's on YouTube, if you haven't watched it, it gives a, a great view into the nice getup that we get to wear. Um, so we wear clean suits. We cover our entire outfit with a clean suit that's only ever been in that room. Um, we do not wear outside shoes inside the room. We wear um, shoes, again, that have only ever been inside of that room and stay clean. And we also get to don hair nets. And so I tell people, um, you don't often think that that lunch ladies and geologists have a lot in common, but in some cases we do. So yeah, we do take things like that into account and try to prevent that um, as much as possible. So great question. Thank you. Arndt, do you want to share with us some more about your time in Vietnam and uh, what all you ended up doing over there? Um, yeah, there are lots of consequences for me being there. So one of our field trips, uh, one of the students in our Vietnamese group, she's from Hanoi, she met our young tour guide who was assigned to us, and now they're married and have two babies. <laughs> so because of our field work, now we even have a family there. And um, so one of our colleagues got uh, tenure, and she's very successful, and the other one has a Fulbright. There are several Vietnamese students who um, have uh, written their thesis about all this work that we've been, we're doing. One of them is now going to Germany for a doctor, doctorate. Uh, we have collaborators also in Germany um, and in Mexico. So the whole group has grown layer by layer. And now we are like uh, probably 10 scientists and uh, 10 students. And it just became from this one nucleus. And it's, it's very rewarding. Fantastic. Thank you, Art. Shelby, I know um, that you started out um, before the pandemic with no teaching responsibilities. And then during the pandemic, um, you kind of caught a baton and were asked to help out. I was just uh, going to ask how you enjoyed that and um, whether you see this as something that you'll be doing for a long time to come. Yeah, so so teaching mid pandemic was definitely a learning experience, I think for me and also the students as well. Um, and so, you know, in, in one sense, I felt fortunate that the first time I was teaching these courses was um, during this pandemic, because I didn't have to go through the hassle of trying to retrofit, you know, years worth of in person teaching to a virtual experience. Um, uh, so I just got to do it virtual from the get go. Um, but it definitely was a different experience, particularly for courses that are very um, sample predominant, you know, there's, there's only so much you can do virtually. And so I think that aspect of, of the geology classes was definitely missed. Um, but we definitely, definitely made the best of it. Um, and I, I think we all have, have gotten through it. And uh, I personally have really enjoyed it. And so I would love to love to continue this um, into the future and in, in any way that I can. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shelby, Arndt, and, and Chen. I think we are going to bring everybody back now, including David Pauly. Um, and David will be available to answer questions too. He kind of snuck out on the panelist list, but if you have any questions for him, now is the time to rapid fire them at him. Um, I just want to thank before you we started um, answering questions. Uh, thank everybody for attending and all of the questions that we've gotten um, so far. I know some of them have actually been answered in the Q&A um, section. I'm gonna try to pop some of those back up um, just so that uh, everybody can see the answers to those or ask those questions so that everybody can hear the answers to those because I think there's been some good questions asked. Um, I will, David, if it's okay, I will go ahead and start with a question and we'll, we'll take a few and then I'll let you wrap things up. Um, the question that most recently got asked is from Tom um, and it was a question for Michael Hamburger. And I personally am actually interested in this because I've heard a lot about the seismograph and I'm wondering whether it survived the renovation. That's a really good question. Uh, and one that's a little complicated to answer. I'm just gonna say, 
uh, that uh, I am in love with that seismograph that I believe Tom's uh, father, Judd Mead, helped us uh, bring to the geology building when it was first built or before it was first built. Uh, and I, I hope to be buried with it uh, someday. Uh, we have kept it alive, but uh, we decided under duress that it was probably best not to keep the mechanical seismograph running during the renovation when the building would be filled with dust and debris. Um, we did keep the digital seismograph running that's part of the um, mid continent seismic network. So that data is still around and available. Uh, and we are preparing to bring the seismograph back to life when the building comes fully back to life and when I get my second vaccination shot. Um, and one exciting thing that has happened as a result of the renovation is that there's actually going to be a, uh, a, a kind of viewing window. It's going to be replaced across the hall from uh, where the instruments are in the old vault. Uh, and so we will have a, uh, a first class seismograph display. Um, and in addition, the geological survey and water survey is building a kind of museum display. And so there will probably be an additional digital display. So the seismograph is spawning. It's gonna be everywhere in the building. Actually, I'd like to add to that a little bit. Um, as I said, I became chair last January and we were literally moving out of the old building um, into our temporary quarters in the survey side. And now we've just, just moved back. And then the pandemic hit. Um, and I'm assuming that when the renovation is over and the pandemic is finished, that all a chair has to do is sit up and watch television with your feet up because um, all of my time has been spent on that. And there have been some areas of the building that have been um, particularly um, I guess I'll, I'll say problematic um, because sometimes it is kind of like playing whack-a-mole. You, you have to know what's going to go wrong, wait for it to almost go wrong, and then ping the right people to say, whatever you do, do not do what you're about to think that you're doing. Um, and one of those areas have been the seismograph area. Um, you sort of had to watch that really carefully during the renovation to make sure they didn't just go in and um, put in new lighting and take out all the electricity and what have you. But um, but yes, we're, we're looking forward to having it fully active again. And as Michael said, in, a, in actually a much more prominent place, um, thanks to um, actually, thanks to them not doing what we said, um, they ended up building a hallway and making the seismograph almost invisible. And so we use that to leverage permission to, to actually put it out in the hall properly and build a big picture window so that you can see it um, very easily from the hall. Fantastic. The other sort of questions that have come up, um, there's been a few questions about work out in Montana at the uh, field station. And I was just going to kind of open this to the group. I know we have some people here with some field station connections um, in the attendee group um, to see whether anybody's planning to do some work out there or have done work out there um, currently. Well, I know that question was uh, directed to me and, and I'll, I'll answer it a little bit, uh, a little bit more verbally. Um, I'm really excited. It was one of the, the most exciting things to be able to come to IU with such a strong field station and access to that both as a teaching and a re research resource. Um, as I've just arrived, <laughs> I haven't figured it, I haven't, I haven't gotten out there yet, um, but I'm really excited to, and I think it's going to be a great place to get some projects going with students. And I've, you know, done some work in the Western U.S. before, and I think that there are some lots of research directions that would be just really well suited. There's you know, such a great geologically interesting place that there's you know, all sorts of uh, questions that we can do out there. So I'm, I'm excited to get some samples and bring them back and get some projects started. I have an, an instrumentation remote sensing course that I currently teach on campus, but connected with the watershed out there by the, the field station. Uh, we have several MET stations and uh, I've been, uh, uh, talking and in, in the early stages of planning a course, uh, um, the aspirational date is summer 2022, in which I would go out there and uh, teach a hands-on instrumentation course in that uh, incredible field environment that is a field station. Um, David, do you uh, want to send things off? Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody again for coming. Um, I know quite a few of you too. Um, some of you I have not met. 
And hopefully when the pandemic um, eases, um, either you have a chance to come visit us or um, we'll be back in Houston again, I hope next year um, and get to see some of you in person. Um, before we go, I'd like to invite you, if you didn't already, to, to have a look at the videos. They're really great. Um, and not only not only the people you've met here have um, done an excellent job in producing them, but Ruth Droppo, who is our um, staff artist, um, produced all of those and just does an amazing job with all of her graphic work and including these. Um, so thanks again. And if you want to get in touch in a, in a more one-to-one -one way, just um, shoot me an email or give me a call and we can set up a meeting. So thanks.